What a treat today. We have a wonderful, high-profile, yet super, super humble guest back on the podcast. You may be very familiar with her. It's Dr. Nisha Manick, rheumatologist, and she's such a wonderful person, and she's part of this year's 2021 Rheumatoid Solutions <laughs> Summit. I'm going to give her her uh, professional intro here, as she's going to be presenting today on the topic of the healing power of intention a case report. It's going to be really, really interesting. Dr. Manick did her fellowship in rheumatology at Stanford University in California. She was faculty in the Division of Rheumatology at Mayo Clinic for more than 11 years. At Mayo Clinic, Nisha served on many boards, including the Inflammatory Arthritis Clinical Working Group. The task was setting the standard of care for patients with RA. Among the many awards that she's received thus far, Nisha received the Top Educator Award at Mayo Clinic Internal Medicine Program. Nisha has written several textbook chapters and scientific journal articles with an emphasis on osteoarthritis and published several articles in premier arthritis journals. Author of the best-selling book, Bridging Science and Spirit, The Genius of William A. Tiller's Physics and the Promise of information medicine, which currently maintains a perfect five-star rating on Amazon. Thanks so much for joining us today, Nisha. Hey, Clint, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me again. Um, you know, uh, I wish my mom would hear all this when you present it. You think she says, "What? What, what are you doing again? You're writing something more?" Yes. <laughs> so. Um, yes. She says, "Go get a real job." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, so, I could have I could have added so much more to that bio. Um, you and I have spoken offline about how you met the the Dalai Lama, and you were you were approached yes. by the organisers of an event at right. at your hospital. Was it at Mayo Clinic? Or that's and they, right. They yes, that's right. Specifically asked you to host the yeah. event. Yes. of his holiness when he came to visit what an what an honor so i could have added <laughs> that <laughs> yeah i mean talk talk about an amazing surprise when a head pops around in your office door and says dr manik would you mind hosting his holiness and i'm thinking uh, oh, oh, excuse me yes we'd like you because you know i i understand um the Eastern spiritual traditions, uh, they knew that. I used to host Tai Chi and talk about spirituality. So it seemed um, that that was the name that popped up. And thank goodness, because it was so much fun, you know, and to to meet him, to meet Jinpa, his translator, was the Mind and Life Institute annual conference. And so um, I met with him for almost two hours on stage and we talked about the history, not only the Mayo Clinic, but a, a, a great institution like Mayo is founded on spiritual principles. And that means it's founded on the intention of not only the Mayo brothers, but the Franciscan nuns of Mayo. So, and it is a good thing to remind ourselves of this as I even as I look at my title slide, you know, the healing power, the healing power to establish something, whether it's in your body, whether it's outer conditions. And in this case, the foundation of truly one of the greats in hospital medicine. Mayo. So um, this is a case report that I'm so delighted, Clint, that we're talking about because this is somebody I've looked after and I continue to follow to this day. And, you know, we're going to talk about things that are really unusual and um, physics, the whole idea of physical illness and the science of physics. And you think, well, where, where does physics fit into this? I'm not talking about radiology, but I am going to cover that your human consciousness has the ability to move things by moving energy. Your consciousness is a source of energy. And energy is very fundamentally a currency of the universe, of nature. And so we'll explore that together. And this is a connection very few people know about. And once your attendees or seminars and when they listen to this talk, I hope they get the greater concept firmly in because once you do, you look at life 
through a very different lens. It really wakes you up. What I'm going to talk today is actually also covered in my book, Bridging Science and Spirit. The word bridge is very significant here because the book is an engineering feat in a sense. I had to be an engineer to really figure out what are the specific ideas in physics and science that takes us from where we are today in our understanding of nature all the way to spirit because science and spirit seem to be very separate. And yet, I'll tell you, they're not separate at all. They're complementary ways of knowledge. They're complementary. They're on the same level. I'm not going to disregard science, and I don't disregard spirituality and spiritual knowledge. They both have their value, and they inform each other, okay? And really, this, this presentation summarizes more than 100 papers. So, so this is a distillation of ideas, and sometimes your viewers may say, well, I don't quite understand that. That's okay. Just let it sit with you. Pick up a copy of the book or come back to this lecture and view it again and again, okay? It will, it will, it will reveal itself to you. One of the things at Mayo Clinic, and it was very, very clear to me, is that we can do all the excellence in chemistry, in our medicines, but food is medicine. OK, and so I took special training in integrative medicine to really refine my understanding and look at the evidence for many of our foodstuffs in our kitchen. Turmeric, uh, uh, cayenne pepper, cinnamon, cloves, oregano, the many, many things that we use. Food is medicine. All right. But I wanted to expand my toolbox even more. If food can be medicine, then the next question is, can human intention be used as a therapy? And this is an incredibly powerful question. How do you get around this? How do you really go to it? And so I want to introduce this patient. And we're going to call him Mark. Um, he is a person I met while I was in rheumatology at Mayo Clinic in around 2006. He has a diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis. And ankylosing spondylitis is a form of inflammatory arthritis that predominantly affects young males, okay? It is um, a disease that affects the spine, the back and the lower back, as well as the peripheral joints. And it's distinct from rheumatoid arthritis in that, in that way. Rheumatoid does not affect the lower back, for example. So this gentleman came to see me with ankylosing spondylitis. By the time he came, you know, he had had at least five to six years of arthritis. It was mostly in his knees and elbow joints. And he had a genetic marker, which we call HLA-B27. This gene marker, if you have it, increases your risk for inflammation. All right. Um, and he had extreme pain, all joints, his knee joints and left elbow was particularly bad. And then we did an outcome measure called the Bath Ankylosing Spondylitis Disease Activity Index, BASDA. BASDA it's like a SED rate. SED rate over the, a benchmark of 20, 21, 25, 30, and so on, we say is inflammation. Well, the BAS die is a, uh, a score that takes many things into consideration, and then you get a value, 0 to 10. His level was 8 when I first saw him. 8 is actually pretty high. That's very active ankylosing spondylitis. So keep the BAS die tucked away in the back of your mind. This is a validated score that any rheumatologist is going to do when they see somebody with ankylosing spondylitis. Now, by the time he came to see me, he had failed many of the traditional pain medications. The first line therapy for ankylosing spondylitis is non-steroidals. Ibuprofen, naproxen, indomethacin. Okay, Voltaren, these are the various classes. And they're really been shown in our research that it benefits people with AS, ankylosing spondylitis. He had failed every class, okay? 
ibuprofen, naproxen, he had failed them all. He was also getting cortisone injection into his knees and elbows by the time he saw me and would get maybe a couple of days of pain relief, but he would be right back where he was. And between uh, 2006 to 2010, you know, this uh, biologics were now pretty, you know, routine in rheumatoid arthritis. And there was some experience in ankylosing spondylitis, so I used them. So we gave him Humira and Eternacept, Enbro. So he was on really the standard of care at that time with biologics, and he had no success. He was also on methotrexate for some time, no success. Now, this is really just part of his excellence in conventional care. In the middle, you see ankylosing spondylitis in rheumatology. I sent him to pain management. 10 out of 10 is very high. This is not the time to be using opiates and morphine and all that. This is not a, this is not a good uh, plan of care. So I sent him to pain management to really open up biofeedback, uh, you know, all kinds of things to try and help his pain. He went to see orthopedics because is there something, you know, uh, mechanically or structurally wrong with his elbow? And he actually had an MRI of his left elbow, and there was a small lymph node in the epitrochlear region in the elbow, and they actually took it out. They thought maybe it's irritating a nerve or something. His pain was absolutely the same. No change. 10 out of 10. He used to say, no, he's 11 out of 10. I sent him to sports medicine at Mayo because these folks really were looking at platelet-rich injections as a way to treat pain. So they had formed this new uh, form of uh, um, you know, sports medicine therapy, and I sent him there. And he said, well, you know, they said it could worsen my pain. I don't want to do it. And so he, he actually, we went through back and forth. Do we do these uh, new uh, experimental platelet-rich plasma injections or not? And, and he, he decided against it. Occupational therapy, he was a businessman and a lawyer. And so at his desk, you know, everything was adjusted just so that his workstation was not irritating his joint symptoms. He went through physical therapy because by the time he was seeing me, he was so disabled with his left elbow, he was pretty much in a, in a sort of a sling and he had wasted away his arm muscles, okay? So he was holding it up. And so we were doing gentle fix physical therapy to really uh, reverse some of this muscle atrophy. He saw neurology many times to see, was this some unusual neuritis? Was this an unusual genetic condition? So we were really trying to cover our bases for this man who was failing to thrive, you know, peak of his career and failing to thrive. And in his personal life, he was uh, really raising golden retrievers, went out the window. He was a skier, went out the window. He loved working out in the gym, canceled his gym membership. And you can see it was really sometimes working at home. So we have somebody here who really was, his, he was just seeing things taken away one by one. It was very distressing. And, you know, I, I came from an integrative perspective. We were doing conventional, but I also said, let's clean up your diet. Uh, let's really do adaptogens, which is adrenal support. Ashwagandha astralagus, which is a Chinese herb, gave him anti-inflammatory support with uh, curcuminoids or turmeric, resveratrol, essential fatty acids with omega-3. He was on, on uh, uh, muscle relaxant supplements like magnesium. His diet was really good. I mean, this is somebody who had a chef, okay? So fermented foods, proteins like moringa to rebuild his muscle tissue. He was on homeopathy to really to ease his pain. Arnica Montana is a type of homeopathy to uh, safely reduce his pain. He had many lifestyle modifications at work and home, and his recreation really was put aside. I introduced him to guided meditation um, and really to write intentions out. I was just studying the tiller work at this time, and so I introduced and opened up some of these perspectives for him. 
So whatever we were doing, really, this is a cartoon from my book. We were really uh, uh, primarily focusing on changing his chemistry. We were trying to reduce his um, uh, sedimentation rate, his C-reactive protein, uh, maintain his hemoglobin, and things like that. Okay, we were really addressing the chemical uh, milieu of the physical body or matter. So, you know, we know this, that, and, and he did some of this in, in physical therapy, is that when you apply external energy to your body, you can actually drive the chemistry such that you can um, impact its physical function. For example, the TENS unit in physical therapy, they put TENS, the unit on his elbow, they run it with electrical currents, and you know the hope is that he'll get some pain relief. So we know that electrical and magnetic energy fields can actually affect chemistry, the internal structures, and, and the function of a joint. And then the question, of course, is that subtle energy, so chi, and I won't go into that here, uh, can also impact the, the energy um, and the chemistry of the body. So which really brings us to this big question. We're familiar with matter and energy, okay? And that is, how does energy really impact chemistry? So when we look at matter and energy, we know through Einstein, that energy and matter are on an equivalent uh, field. Energy is contained in matter, and that relationship is e equals mc squared. Energy equals matter times the speed of light squared. So each atom of energy is tremendous amount of energy tucked into it. And this is the basis of nuclear energy. If you split atoms, you get nuclear uh, power released. So, so each atom has tremendous energy potential. So matter and energy are equivalent. And then we come into the th second law of thermodynamics, which is the law of the universe. Okay, this is the one equation I want your folks to just, just look at this. I know it looks like, oh, oh, you know, it's too many terms. Um, this is my reaction when I first saw this with Diller. I said, I don't know if I can do this. But essentially, Gibbs free energy is what makes energy and nature run. What creates um, delta G, that is free energy, pressure times volume, which is a steam engine, internal energy, minus temperature times entropy, okay? Any change in these terms to the right side of the equal sign can uh, lead to Gibbs free energy and work. This is how physics sees energy. It is uh, a way to do useful work. In medicine, energy is calories. In physics, energy is the capacity to do work, okay? This is really an important uh, distinction in thinking. I want you to tuck that away. Before you move on, yeah. just explain yes. and just explain the definition of entropy. Oh, we're coming to that. Oh, good. Okay. We're coming to that. So if we look at this equation, we're going to see that chemistry actually, chemistry doesn't change pressure or volume of your body. It really works through this internal energy, entropy, and temperature terms, okay? So the so this is really what I'm coming to here. That drugs, uh, the chemical potentials in drugs, change Gibbs free energy through the E equal E minus T S term. This term, uh, I'm sorry. This term. Okay. So this is where tablets work. This is where biologics work. This is where steroids, Tylenol, aspirin. They're important. So we want to know that they actually obey the second law of thermodynamics. And if we look at energy or subtle energies, the PV term, when you, when you press or press certain acupoints on the, on the face, on the extremities, this is actually doing something to the chemistry underneath through the pressure volume term. Now, I won't go into all these details, but it's really that it obeys the second law also, 
So energy flow in a system organizes it. Okay, energy flowing from the sun through all of the earth uh, sphere and through all of the system organizes it. And any energy transformation can be traced back to thermodynamics and ultimately the thermonuclear battery in the sky. Now, this is a cartoon from my book. So we capture the solar energy through plants, photosynthesis, which makes sugars, which are eaten by us. Uh, mitochondria use that to make ATP, which is how I can move. And we excrete carbon dioxide and water as waste, which is cycled back. The plants use this. So let's go back to my patient because, you know, 2011, you know, he's now in dire straits. I had, <laughs> we're throwing everything at the, and the kitchen sink at him conventionally. Um, he had failed biologics. He had failed a lot of the integrative uh, therapies. He was on fermented foods, omega-3s, anti-inflammatory diet. He was doing everything. And when you looked at his chart, this, this man was not doing well. And he was now desperate. And he says, I want something, anything done. I left Mayo Clinic by now to really study uh, Tiller's work. And so I sent him to a Qigong master in Minneapolis. And Master Chun Yi Lin is a founder of Spring Forest Qigong. And so this gentleman, Mark, went to him and Master Lin did subtle energy external Qigong healing. And there was dramatic pain relief. I mean, it was like, wow, this is, this is like a steroid effect. What happened? But it was only one day. Only one day. And that was amazing. Okay, so he did have an effect just one day. So here we are. We did the chemistry. I'm now doing some energetic work on him, not just with the TENS unit. We're doing subtle energy work. And he had some effect, but only short-lived. And this is where I broached this with my mentor. This is William Tiller. He's a professor of... Um, material science and engineering at Stanford University. He's now retired. He's 93 years old and did lots of his really amazing work, not just conventional physics. Material science means he's an expert in creating new materials through the knowledge of atoms and molecules. Um, but he also did something very interesting. Along with conventional physics, he was also doing work on human consciousness. And he did that in parallel with conventional physics because he was so fascinated that how can human beings have capabilities to um, move things with, with Qigong? He was actually, he had studied Qigong masters in the lab by this time. So he was very fascinated that these things actually happen. We need to understand it. In medicine, we didn't have a good framework but physics does. Physics starts to look at uh, thermodynamics and equations and sees, well, how does this fit into the great scheme of things? And he was the perfect person to do this work because he saw that when you hold an intention, it is the very decision that starts to move the subtle energies in the body systems. And he said, well, when I asked him the question about Mark, he says, Nisha, you folks have done the best chemical medicine and the blocks in Mark are not chemistry based. They're only partly there and they, it will fail. And they're not just energy either. We have to go to higher levels. And I remember when he had this discussion with me, it seemed to hit home. It seemed to hit home. The primary source is not chemical or energetic, they have to be at higher levels. And so when we look at this cartoon again, we have a cascade of healing effects from higher level spirit, which is a source like the sun, and you have this cascade of healing effects, they could be um, a block at any of these levels that uh, give rise to entropy, that give rise to disorder. And when we go on higher levels, you go to higher organizing principles. And it, to me, it seemed very logical. And now I know this seems complex, but let this sit with you. 
So the universal law number two is that energy is connected with information, okay? And it is through the entropic function. So another way to look at entropy is disorder is more likely. Everything in the universe is marching to disorder. And while in the physical body, we do things to the physical body, we take vitamins, we take omega-3, we take chemicals to keep it orderly. We keep it tight against disorder, all right? So we're all aging, we're all having inflammation, we're all going to, well, die one day, all right? <laughs> but as much as we can prevent that or prevent that from happening, elongating the time to that inevitability is where medicine, nutrition, keeping our homes safe, having, you know, electricity, lighting, all of that. That is order. But I want you to keep this also in your mind because this is such a simple principle, but it is fundamentally true. And we come to this real genius here, Erwin Schrodinger, who wrote this book, What is Life? And I really say this is worth a, a read. And in this book, he says, life, life maintains itself on low entropy. And he goes on to write in his book, in addition to energy content, its entropy content should also be displayed. Now, if you look at any packaging in a, in a packet of crisps or a chocolate bar, you flip it around and we look at energy, like 250 kilocalories. That's the energy you're going to get. If you eat French fries, you're going to get 500 calories in a French fries serving, right? So he says entropy content should also be displayed. How does that look like? Let's look at that. Somebody's done this experiment, all right? Somebody's actually eaten um, McDonald's fries all the time for a month. And what was it called? I can't remember. Anyway, but you'll recognize. I, I forget this. his name, but are you referring to the meal, uh, the, the film Super Size Me? Super Size Me. That's it. That's it. So this has been done. So as far as energy is concerned, you can survive on French fries for morning, afternoon lunch, and evening dinner. But you are missing crucial information required to keep your body at low entropy. This is it, okay? Look at this again. You can eat French fries all the time you want and you'll get your energy content. But do you have disease-free state? And he did not. Super Size Me goes on to show that. What if we gave him cauliflower? So it's a worthwhile experiment. You can I write about grapefruit. You can do it with chocolate. You can do it with any kind of diet. But this is why diets fail. Because even if you gave this man cauliflower, you know, juiced cauliflower in the morning, steamed cauliflower in the afternoon, and then you give him fried cauliflower in the evening, same energy equivalent of cauliflower he would have a similarly unbalanced, nutrition-poor profile, and he would get into disorder. This is why a low-entropy diet. This is a well-balanced diet. It's information-rich. So you can start to see that information is not just digital things. I'm re re really referring to the diversity and in the macronutrients fats, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, okay? And a whole variety, a whole color on your plate. That's a low entropy diet. And, and physics really now agrees that we used to say energy is everything. No, information is everything. Because you can get your energy this way, but you're gonna get disease. You want to have information 
in your energy intake. Whatever matter you take in, make sure it's diverse with information rich sources. And, you know, I have to put my, um, uh, my gratitude, you might say, and my hat tip to Claude Shannon. And, you know, Tiller really, really loved Shannon. He says, this was one of the geniuses of physics because he really broke down that information is physical, physical. That means you can, he, he broke information down into bits. It's the unit, just like the temperature is centigrade and Fahrenheit and, and unit of uh, distance is yard or a meter or centimeter or a millimeter. Shannon broke information down into bits, zero and one. Yes, no, yes, no. Everything can be broken down into that. It's, it's a mathematical genius. I invite your, <laughs> when, I, when I really read this work, I thought, when it, when it finally sunk in, I went, wow. Because I could say hello or jambo in Swahili or Kemcho. This, he had made it into yes, jambo, hello, into yes. Okay, you can write that. And it's, it's distilled into a bit of information. I really, I, I really invite your um, seminar people listening to this to really explore Shannon because it will really amazingly open up your perspective into how this man opened the digital age because suddenly we could see Mona Lisa, we can see arts, we can see music and mathematics just at the drop on our screens. And if I had to break down even the words, Claude Shannon, father of information theory, you can actually translate this into zeros and ones, which is what I did here. This is compressed information into Claude Shannon, father of information theory. Okay. This it's is how. Yeah. It's fascinating, Nisha. And it, it, uh, it takes me back to my work I used to do in optoelectronics. My background is laser physics. And the way that you and I are communicating right now, is that there is a semiconductor laser that is flicking on off and on and off meaning ones and zeros sending an extremely fast signal of zeros and ones through an optical fiber under the ocean between sydney and the united states that's then being translated back into a digital signal electrical signal also yes and then transferred into your modem which is ones and zeros into your computer which interprets that and reconfigures the image and sound back onto our screens so exactly exactly phenomenal. right it's phenomenal right we're and using you know, this to right compress now. it into zeros and ones this was his genius it's his logarithmic to the base of two zero one Okay, and it's, it's, it's actually quite simple. And it, this is how Claude Shannon and Boltzmann are really together in information and, and Boltzmann was about thermodynamics and energy, but they actually are talking about really fundamentally the same things. Um, people can argue about it. They say energy and information. Well, um, you know, Boltzmann and Claude Shannon are actually quite different. They're not. Um, information is physical. Um, so. Let's let's then talk about intention because who creates that information? Who creates it? It's my consciousness. My consciousness through my intention creates something. In this case, it was creating this talk to show up and communicate with Clint Patterson. All right. But I like this. In, this is uh, Tiller's definition. And I said, so intention, he says, Nisha. Intention is a process of creation. It's just truly poetic and beautiful. Okay, so we can say a dictionary is just one aim. Yeah, it is. But intention fundamentally is a process of creation. And so we can create music. We can create equals MC squared. We create zeros and ones, to be or not to be, music, the pie, you know, we creating that. Um, yeah, it's me, all of it. <laughs> I, I created this cartoon, you know, it's just, um, 
uh, we are creating things that physically endure so that my thinkingness is not some fun. You, you're making it physically enduring out there. So Tiller took this um, knowledge that, okay, our intention is a process of creation, but does that intention actually do something out there? Can it actually uh, change a material? Remember, he's a material scientist. So he took water as his first target experiment. And he said, let me test my intention to change this water uh, it's pH, okay, without any additional physical components or chemical components. And the measurement accuracy was very fine with an electronic pH meter. And he uh, really knew the science that human intention, again, I'm compressing a lot of science here into this one slide. Human intention can be imprinted into an object. It can be a crystal, it can be a little device like this that Tiller used, and he used this device because it can be replicated by other physics laboratories, okay? An imprinted thing like this is not inert. This is metastable. It's excited uh, uh, above equilibrium state where it holds is a repository of human information, okay? It, this is what he then used in his target experiments. And this is really, this is so fantastic because when I first saw this, I thought this is not possible. How can human intention in a box then go on to change water? But it does. And I encourage people who are watching this to get my book because you get the whole bridge, all right? But it is possible. It has been done and replicated. So you can see the pH of water decreasing quickly. Carbon dioxide is dissolving, making it more acidic. By thermodynamic calculations, the, the yellow band is where, is where it would settle at. But you can see over some weeks, it goes up against thermodynamics calculations. I mean, this is amazing. And he did that with a pH reducing intention. And um, this shows us that human intention is incredibly powerful, all right, if you know how to use it. Can, I, went just, on to can I try and paraphrase what you've said so that I understand it correctly and that our audience also is seeing the incredible mm -hmm. uh, outcomes that you've displayed on the screen here? So is this correct that the methodology was that Dr. Tiller used intention, purely thought, and, and uh, focused that intention into a device that could hold the intention energy or the intention state for a period of up to six months. And then he placed that device next to a glass of water, which was being measured for its pH. The intention that was imprinted into that device was that the pH would in the first experiment go up and despite you, you know typical you know trends of what that water would do the intention that was stored and being released continuously from the device did indeed make the water ph rise continuously and was measured over a period of time is that correct exactly exactly it's, it's mind so mind. this is this is um this is revolutionary. Mm. This is revolutionary science that he is able to show, not through a brain function, but saying that this invisible thing we call consciousness and its tool is intention can actually do something. Mm. It can actually change measurably a huge signal by a whole pH unit water which is very familiar to us okay and then he went on to do this with alkaline phosphatase so in other words a human enzyme alkaline phosphatase is something that controls calcium and bone health uh it's a liver enzyme too um that with his intention uh really ramped up the alkaline phosphatase 
chemical potential. So five molecules was doing the work of six, but there was only five molecules. So he could actually increase the chemical activity of a enzyme in the Petri dish, just with this, again, with this intention. And people have done this with cell growth and things like that, but he was doing it with alkaline phosphatase. And then he went on to show this with a fruit fly, okay? In, in a way that the fruit flies, um, two week life cycle is shortened to where the fruit fly is maturing faster, is making more fruit flies, is a happier fruit fly, okay? He, he called it, the, I'm creating happy fruit flies. And I thought that was very fun. And because he, he was really coming from the heart that we should not destroy life systems. We need to do our science in a way that shows, yes, we are able to impact things very, very meaningfully and without destruction. So really, you know, when we look at coming back to medicine, we've seen that energy can affect chemistry, structure, and function, again, very loosely. But we're really, really extending this, this relationship to include intention and information. So information has the power to change materials and living systems. Let's go back to my patient because I want to—I I don't want us to forget this this really amazing thing that we did with with Mark, because here he is. He's saying, "I want something, anything done to help me." All right, uh, he is doing all of the integrative medicine. He is doing uh, subtle energy. He was having healing sessions with Master Chun Lin. He had dramatic pain relief, but only for twenty four hours. So this is where we were. And I broached Tiller. I said, okay, he says, it's not in chemistry. It's not energetic. It must be higher up. And by this time, you know, Mark said, I want you to really come back into my sphere and really take on the healing. And I said, well, I don't know what else I can really do. But his Mayo chart was sent. I called his rheumatologist. And his rheumatology says, you know, I really don't have much to offer him. I want you to do anything you want. I said, wow. And I read his chart and the neurology is saying we have nothing to offer him. Sports medicine, plasma rich platelets being rejected. OK. And, you know, I went through this two inch notes and, and we knew that, OK, we've got to do something. And so Mark is saying, well, what are you going to do? I said, we're going to do information medicine. <laughs> so Tiller says, he better know this is not FDA approved. All right. And I drew up a consent form for Mark to sign off. It was free. Okay. And so Mark had, with me and Mark talking to each other on the phone, on the phone, we had to arrive to a benchmark to outcomes that he really wanted, all right? So there is me, Mark, and Dr. Tiller. We had to arrive to a system, to something, his intention, and you can see it, this, this sort of target, uh, that would be meaningful for Mark. And, you know, from, for, for me as a scientist, I really was rigorous in my BASDI scores, pain scores. He had had an MRI of his elbow at baseline in Vietnam, you repeated it at six months. And all of his interventions by his rheumatologist, if they were changed, then I never interfered with him. Okay. I was just his information medicine person. This is the qualitative art outcomes. And this is really where it was so beautiful because there was cooperation between me, Mark in Minneapolis and Dr. Tiller in Arizona. Dr. Tiller's never met him, even today. Never met him, only talked to him on the phone briefly, but ultimately it was Mark and me really nailing down the emotional 
physical and mental goals of the program. They were identified. And with those, and Tiller says, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure about this? So Mark actually said the pain relief, he actually says reduction, reduction, okay? He, he had lost hope by now that pain would even be impacted. Honestly, he had seen the world's experts in pain and neurology and everybody and said, you know, okay, if it reduces, I'm okay with that. But he really wanted actually cardiac health. He was very afraid of dying of a heart attack because he couldn't exercise. And he's a male, white, you know, inflammation. So he knew that if he was going to die, it's from a heart attack. <laughs> so he says, I want my heart to be healthy. And so Dr. Tiller took these things, these wishes, and created new information. And then wrote it out. So he wrote a physical thing. He created new information on pen and paper and ended beautifully with thy will be done. And I know this is in the summit, um, Clint, because this is really important. Tiller surrendered the outcomes to God. He didn't insist on anything. He just said, Mark, this is what you want. I'm going to write it out. Does this feel right? And when Mark says, you know, I think this is close, that will be done. We were all at peace with it. Me as his physician, Mark, and Tiller. Okay, we were in a creative process together. And so this is the imprinting. This is Tiller, all of his, uh, this is Jane Tiller. And he has two other people, usually his lab assistant, Greg Fandel, and a fourth person. Uh, at that time was Walter Dibble. Okay, four of them go into meditation and imprint this device on a table. And then it's imprinted and then it's shipped to Mark. All right. So Tiller, when he holds an intention, I hold it, I'm like a light bulb. Everything is like a destructive interference. It's sort of there, but Tiller was like a laser. And so this, just imagine this little thing here is like a device that holds that intention and it's going to broadcast to Mark like a laser. And this is the, this is the, the one-year information medicine program baseline 2012 and every three months we would check in all right um he had his uh baseline mri here too and i would check in with the score systems emotional and mental outcomes and we would just keep going you know and every three months the device would be shipped back to tiller to re-imprint it because information leaks away and it goes back to equilibrium, all right? So this is Federal Express. We would ship it out to him. Um, and he would, he would unwrap it and plug it into his bedroom and let it run. That's all he did. And he would sometimes, you know, Tiller said, hold the device and give gratitude for the medicine, the information you're receiving. Um, and then I would collect his outcome measures. So this is what really happened, which is very fascinating for me and Tiller, because we'd never done this before. We'd never done this before. In the first few weeks, this is very impressive because Mark, from feeling hopeless and full of anxiety, started to have a different language. I feel more hopeful. It was so striking. And it, you, you could say it was an inside out healing. Whereas the body we go, you know, we look at the joints, we look at it with blood testing and uh, imaging. Um, it's an outside in healing. This was really strikingly inside out. All right. He says, you know, I don't know, I still have pain, but I actually feel more hopeful. 
I just feel less anxiety. It was really striking in his language on the phone. Before you go so, on, sorry, just I'm before sorry. you, this is a yeah. crucial slide uh, mm -hmm. that I've seen him put. Was he doing anything himself? Was he writing down these intentions and meditating and focusing on them and saying affirmations? Or was it all coming from the device that had been imprinted by the team of, of imprinters? We didn't give him any other direction other than un unwrap it and plug it in into your home. That's it. Wow. Wow. He, he wow. wasn't, okay. you know, if he was doing some Tai Chi, maybe, but it wasn't consistent and we didn't give him directions. What we did Correct. say, Tiller did say was hold the device and give gratitude because this is, it's like a sacred object. It was in a very high level imprinted with healing. Thy will be done information. The yeah. thy will be done is the Lord's prayer. Hmm. Okay. So, hmm. um, and, you know, I was just fascinated. Let's see what happens here because we've done everything we can in the chemical, in the integrative medicine, energy medicine, Qigong, and this man is still suffering. And this is interesting because his BASDAI score actually never budged. Okay. His pain score never budged. His MRI exam was repeated in six months and there was minimal enhancement at the elbow, but no synovitis. Synovial enhancement was really minimal. And Tiller and I would talk about this and we said, we're dealing with a nonlinear program. It's not like, Let's give him two Tylenol and then it'll get better. It was nonlinear. And we'll come to this, what this means later on. So we ex actually, actually, Mark says, can you extend it? Because actually, I like this. I like this. Can you do, if you don't mind, can we keep doing this every three months? And we extended it to 36 months. Now, I would touch base with him every six months, I, you know, beyond the three years, I kept in touch. So his program ended in 2015, and I would keep every six months touch base with him. By this time, Tilla wasn't sending him the device, but something was happening to him. He was not on any biologics. And then lo and behold, July 2018, I call him up. How are you doing? He says, Dr. Manning, for no apparent reason, my pain is gone. I said, excuse me, what do you mean by that? He says, I just noticed overnight, literally, my arm is moving. And it was really his left elbow which, that would really bother him. My pain has disappeared. And this was fascinating because his BASDI, he sent me his BASDI score. It had gone into remission. He's now no longer employed. Uh, he's retired, but he's back to his old hobbies of retriever, golden retriever, retriever uh, walk. He, he loves to, dogs and golden retrievers, and he walks them. He's not been on any further biologics since 2010. When this happened in July 2018, he wasn't on any Enbrel, Humira, ibuprofen. He hadn't had any injections, nothing. He hadn't seen the rheumatologist for uh, you know a few years by then. And I said, did you see? Did you tell your doctor? He says, no, I don't see them anymore. I, haven't, I, I, I don't feel the need to go there. So this was really interesting because suddenly something happened in his biology that we cannot completely Explain, And I've presented this to other physicians and doctors. And I said, how many of us in the room have seen a spontaneous remission in ankylosing spondylitis? And not one hand went up. And I haven't seen this. I've looked in the NIH National Library of Medicine for case reports of people suddenly going into remission, and no, there's no case like this. I have written this. I have not submit. I put this in abstract form in international conferences. So I have presented this work 
but it does deserve a full length paper. Um, what was so fascinating to me was that multiple levels of Mark were addressed. Okay, not just his physical, but his cardiac health. And what was interesting, that this was an inside out process. It was his emotions, his anxiety that lifted very, very quickly. And it remained like that throughout. And it was funny because even though his physical pain hadn't alleviated, his emotions were taking um, were taking the front seat, you might say. And that is important, you see, because that engages your nervous system, your parasympathetic nervous system, and does go into various levels of your being and of your uh, immune system function. And really information, the way Tiller does it, is a source of free energy to do useful work at very deep levels of Mark. So I think in chemical medicine, there is a disconnect, you know, because the trajectory that Mark was on, we were doing fancy biologics, new things, new MRI, new, you know, injectable therapies, but that's not what he wanted, you know. Um, Clever new molecules was not where Mark wanted to be. And he even says, I don't want that. And, and when he contacted me, he says, please, can I explore this energy and this information that you kept talking about? And that's where we said, okay, we'll open it up in a compassionate way because it's not FDA approved. You can do these things. He had signed a consent form. And that's where we opened up all of the things that were meaningful for him and to create a, an intentional statement. So let's get back to chemical or chemistry and, and medicine as we practice this. This is Isaac Newton. And the real problem in medicine is this, that we think in medicine that everything is predictable like a mechanistic thing, like the clockwork universe. You do this and you'll get this. You get Humira, you're going to get this. You take Tylenol, you're going to get this. And by and large, it's sort of okay-ish, but we get stuck there. We're not in a clockwork universe anymore. And to use an analogy, one degree shift in a ship's direction will get you in a different direction, okay? Just one degree shift. And months and months later, that ship is in a different direction and it defies calculations. Tiller could predict macro systems, but this is a whole new level of complexity. A human system is just way, way more complex. And as I was thinking about this, and I've written this in the book in a different way, I'm going to put chaos theory, the butterfly effect. All right. And people might be familiar with the butterfly effect, which is Edward Lorenz. You know, he's a, a weatherman. He's a meteorologist, and he used to predict weather systems. And he used computer simulations of this. And when he was doing this one day, he goes off for a coffee break, and he comes back to the computer and says, whoa. His calculations and what the computer had simulated were very different for a two-month simulation, okay? Two-month, uh, you know, prediction of what the weather might look like. And he went, how come this happened? He comes back after a coffee break and the computer had done something very different. And he looked at his calculations and what the computer had done very carefully. And he saw that he had rounded off one variable, 0 0.050612. Okay, he had rounded it off. And that tiny alteration drastically transformed the whole pattern of simulation. In other words, he had a powerful insight that a tiny scrap of change can have magnitudes of consequences down the road. 
and he called it the butterfly effect. A butterfly can flap its wings in South America and can have consequences of a tornado in Kansas. And it challenges the classical understanding of nature. We think the body is like clockwork. We do this, we do this, we do this, and it will be perfect. But human consciousness is there. All right? Human systems are incredibly complex, like the weather. You can correct for the wind system and the temperature and the humidity. We can correct for the omega-3 fish oils and give him turmeric and give him energy. But it is unpredictable, people. Let's put this in Mark's timeline. Because that scrap of information, laser light, that Tiller delivered to Mark's system in the very beginning had imperceptible, like a flap of a butterfly. It was there. And then he imprinted it. The butterfly is there inside. We cannot see it. We cannot measure it. Because if I tested his um, blood system and measured his sed rate and his BASDA is the same, but we, but we know that some changes are occurring. Ultimately, we saw a big shift in Mark, and it happened like a nonlinear effect, okay? Overnight, overnight, don't give up, don't give up. And Mark knew, he knew something was happening to him. And he says, please, don't give up. Can I extend the program? And Tiller says, I'll be delighted to. And we kept going. I'm clicking my finger. We kept going. <laughs> And then we ended it at 2015, but I kept following because we knew something had taken something. The smallest change in Mark had kicked off a motion. And that I was going to keep following up to see what the effect would be. And he healed. And it was sustained. A Tylenol may not be sustained. We take Tylenol again. We inject humor in two weeks. And again in two weeks. And again in two weeks. This was sustained. And remember, cost effective. His program cost hundreds of thousands of dollars of imaging, biochemicals, appointments, multiple specialists all with their hands on deck all trying to do their best. It's fine. We want to do that. But this is something so unique. So we can do all these genes. We HLA-B27 was positive. He didn't smoke. Environment, immune regulation, you know, with all of our things. All of these are variables that we're familiar with, but we are forgetting information and field effects in healing. This is where the butterfly effect is taking place. And mind you folks, it's very, very important. And so let's expand this mass energy relationship of, of uh, Einstein, okay? Mass and energy becomes energy and information are connected and consciousness. We are the source, people, all that information. All right. So this is beautiful because we're not locked into this mass and energy all the time. We're now becoming participants in life in that mass and energy relationship. So, you know, one of the things I routinely ask my patients is what gives you meaning? Just like with Mark, what gives you meaning? 
So with that, I end it here. It's it's a bit longer than I anticipated, Clint. Um, but thank you for giving me this opportunity. And you know, to me, to this day, I'm still extremely astonished that a tornado took place in a good way in Mark's life. That he says, "Hey, Doctor Manic, my pain is gone." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "It's it 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 just I don't know. It just it went away." Mm. And that's a gift. And to this day, Tiller is still not met Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, what a, what a gift from all of you who came together, including Dr. Tiller, to be able to put that intention into that device on such a, you know, frequent basis and kept that going because it's not, you know, it's it's not sort of the thing that we normally get to each day is sitting down around the table and say, let's all put our collective intention into someone else's well-being and i mean that is just obviously an extraordinarily uh beautiful thing to do for another human being um, oh you know what? and you know it brings to that to you that uh to at least i've now learned so much about psalms and because tiller's spiritual practices psalms he contemplates them but he um he brought to my mind that Matthew's teaching where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I also in the midst of them. It's sort of, um, I'm probably getting it completely wrong, but you get the gist of it. And Tiller often says, the unseen colleagues are with us. So I think this was truly, truly marvelous um, that this one man's life changed deep inside deep inside his whole structure so that chemical potential was jiggled in his body and jiggled and jiggled each time and that you get a whole new chemistry but he took time and then boom you know boom you got a new structure mm. children do this much much quicker tiller's done this with uh children autistic children and uh the feedback is like within the, the 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 device is switched on, and the and and a mom in Australia actually said, "Whoa, you know, a phone call like um my my child is speaking sentences." Wow. So I think there is something very very so there is coherence. Let me put it this way. So instead of disorder or entropy, there is uh he's nudging systems to coherence to a new coherence. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, thinking in terms of audience's position here, their questions would be, well, well, how can I incorporate this into my life? And um, falling short of having Dr. Tiller do one of these devices for each and every mm -hmm. one of us, which we would all be blessed to have. Um, the answer to that is that you have provided a presentation just like this explaining how we can implement intention into our mm. lives to achieve healing and to achieve things that we so yeah. deeply desire in our summit session. It's right. the, it's a yes. free summit. Everyone who has enjoyed this, go to uh, Rheumatoid Solutions and join the free summit and you will have as just a fascinating and, and wonderfully inspiring uh, presentation is what Dr. Manick has given us today. And it teaches you step by step how to manifest what you want in life by mm -hmm. using the power of intention and that focused energy that creates a physical form in the future. And, and it is, it is like fascinating. So I'm not going mm -hmm. to ask because the answer requires a one hour presentation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, go to the go to that wonderful yeah. presentation. The seven yes. steps to creating a powerful uh mm -hmm. intention. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what I will ask you then instead is how can people work with you, contact you? You've got your URLs on the screen, but for those mm -hmm. just listening, just cover that for us. Yeah. So um nishamaticmd.com is uh my general site, my book site. Bridging Science and Spirit is, and I really encourage um, your viewers to or your followers to get this because you really dive in, and this is such a um, such an overview that once you get it, once you get that there are 
this this science works with universal laws. You just can't go wrong. You can be on planet Jupiter or moon or it still works, okay? Um, it, it just is in alignment with natural laws. Uh, and the word law is very significant here. It's, you know, it's not quantum theory. And I think once quantum theory develops even more, we'll find that um, it is also a very important science, but information theory and laws of thermodynamics Tiller is built on giants and it will serve you. And to learn this science, you are growing in your own consciousness. Your bandwidth expands. You're not just a consumer passively of information. You are now a creator. And so I just encourage you all, nishamanicmd.com. There is a paper there on um, one of the one of the aspects of Tiller's science, which is the physical space, and I won't go into it here. Um, and then rheumatology, Sandra Cruz, please, by all means, if you want to work with me, uh, and one of the limitations here is that I work with people with rheumatic diseases, and I think it's important because I know and understand their unique challenges. This gentleman is ankylosing spondylitis, but I know rheumatoid, gout, lupus, fibromyalgia. I look after people with those conditions. Um, and if you do want to work with me, it'll be more like a health and wellness coach because I can't always be a doctor to people all around the world. There are regulations I want to be sensitive to. But by all means, you know, contact me through Rheumatology Santa Cruz. I, I really do reply to messages. Not really. I always reply to messages. And we can always see, is it a fit or do, does this make sense? Um, then, yeah, by all means, contact me through that. Uh, through those two uh, portals. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Manik. And you have some people from our community who you've been working with for a very yes. long time, which yes. is testimonial to the <laughs> overlap between our philosophies and the way yeah. that you, uh, you know, help and, and help people uh, head in the right direction with these things that are just so, so uh, fundamental to yes. human life. And that's why I get goosebumps on this topic. Uh, you know, we spoke about this on our summit talk a lot. Is like just lots of goosebumps because, oh, my gosh. And I was showing, you know, and I have my book that I bring with me everywhere. I take this everywhere, up and down the street. Yes, with me. You know, and I you won't believe it. Book. I have mine yes. too. So there's yeah. my, yeah. There's my your, book. Your beautiful mm-hmm. version. Mine's a 20-cent <laughs> grocery store version. <laughs> but it does the trick, right? It's not the paper it's on. It's what's on the paper. Yes. So. Yeah. So and thank it's the you, motivation you bring to it, and the emotion, the yeah. curiosity, the the feeling of self discovery. Mm. So, so it was very interesting how Mark was hesitant about even addressing pain. He just was so worried about dying of heart, of heart mm. failure, or heart attack. Mm. And when he put that out there, I said, "Oh, you see, I'd never realized it. I was just talking about elbow, elbow, elbow." And when he says, no, doctor, I really am worried about my heart. And so he could talk freely. And he and just that exploration, that discovery was very important, you see. And so we could put it into his intention. And so he felt, oh, thank you. So it wasn't just about let's put you on a new aspirin. <laughs> so I'm not making small of these, but I think there was this this reconnection uh, for me as his physician and for him that I, I want to really go into this unknown area. And I know there's no guarantees, but boy, it is so fun to really talk and get this off my chest, hmm. you know, is and this- do you feel this is your calling in terms of your next sort of stage of your professional career? Uh, do you get more hyped and excited about um, this area of helping people um, at the moment than than what you were getting, say, in your previous, uh, I don't know, time before meeting Tiller? You know, I would say that science is really, it is really such a key aspect of modern life. And science is limiting. (laughs) And I got limited very quickly in medicine. And it was, I wouldn't say boring,
But I found that I was in this invisible cage and it disturbed me quite a bit. It disturbed me to no end that I was throwing things, trying everything for many times. But I would say one third of my patients, you know, one in three would say, you take doing this biologic, this biologic, this bi-, and it was, and it was frustrating. It was very um it was limiting and I couldn't, I couldn't accept it. I was not going to stand for it. So the exciting thing was when I when I realized that spirituality also is like a science. You do certain things, you look for outcomes. And if you look at certain pathways, and I've done retreats, the teacher, the guru, the rishi, a rishi is a Sanskrit term for a mentor, will say, has this happened to you? Tell me what's going on. All right. So in a retreat, they say, will you have certain things, certain um, benchmarks? It's just like a science experiment. You Have you reached this? Have you reached this? Have you reached this Bazdai score? So in spirituality and science, we actually have, ex- they're, all, they're the same. We, I don't know why we separate them. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't be, okay? So we, so Tiller, I think, was a gift in the sense that he really bridged scientific method and the spiritual inquiry tightly together. So when I wake up in the morning and I write my intentions, I do my meditation. I read a scripture. It could be Buddhist scripture. It could be Christian. It, right now, I'm reading Gita, uh, the Hindu Gita. It, it doesn't matter. They're all unified. They're all, they're, there's non-duality, non-separation. And so from there, then I can um, write my intention. Actually. Father, please usher in a world of robust consciousness. So I'm I'm asking for world healing. And I use language that I developed on my own because after Tiller, we would discuss intention statements quite a lot. And so I write that because we have great um, upheaval. There's a transition happening and we watch it and we assist it. I'm not separate from things in Australia or Canada or California or anywhere else. I'm a participant. So with that in mind, I say, well, I may be in this little home, this little address, but I know that I am connected and entangled with all events. Thy will be done. And so I write it and close it and say thanks because that awareness i'm not idle no and i know that that prayerful way reaches to the ends of the cosmos Mm. beautiful beautiful well it's it's certainly been wonderful to have this conversation and to learn from you today and i can um, and i can imagine that you raised a few eyebrows and 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 changed the mood amongst the uh, rheumatology conference when you presented this information amongst physicians yeah. who would have heard just more incremental sort of changes to drug treatments and medicines and so forth so yeah. what a breath of fresh air this is and thank you so much and uh, uh folks have the uh the details on how to contact you and um, and talk whether or not um, they might be able to to um, get your help um, and also you're a frequent member um, contributor to our uh, members within rheumatoid solutions and rheumatoid support you come on and you do our monthly live calls periodically as well and I'm very grateful for that so thank you Dr Menick this has been amazing much appreciated thank you Jacqueline. be well out there okay <laughs>